A few months ago, I had a very interesting and painful conversation with my mom. I knew her father died when she was five. So I asked her, Mom, do you have any recollection, any memory of your father? And she said, you know, not too much. I mostly got to know him from a photo. But she went on saying, you know, your grandma, my mom, always used to tell me, if at least your younger brother had survived, you would have known what your father was like, because everybody said he was the spit and image of his father. Now, this little boy that uh, would have been my uncle, Alex, he died when he was five. Of course, these are dramatic family stories, and I know every family has dramatic stories. It is significant for me because I remember in my childhood, I would go sometimes to visit with my grandma, and I would play around in the neighborhoods with the kids. And I heard the elderly ladies speak when they saw me. They went like, see, watch, watch his clothes. He's the spit and image of his grandfather. Now, mind you, my father also has curly hair. And yet, for those ladies, my grandfather's, maternal grandmother's, gra uh, grandmother's, grandfather's generation, I was the spit and image of my grandpa. If only my uncle Alex had survived, I would have known what my grandfather was like through his son. Humanity is in somewhat similar situation. We have a father. He's alive. He, he never died. And yet we have never seen him. But humanity has gotten a chance to see the father through whom? Through his son, because his son is the spit and image of his father. Isn't that beautiful? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are here to see you through Jesus Christ, your son. We pray that the Holy Spirit will touch our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. The prologue of the Gospel of John, from which we have taken already four sermons, and this is the fifth, is a beautiful hymn. It is a hymn because in those days when John wrote his Gospel, in early Christianity, they used to sing hymns. Hymns were unknown in the Old Testament. Hymns is a new worship genre that appears in the New Testament. Hymnos in the Greek world used to be a song dedicated to the gods. So now the early Christians, they took that hymnos from the Greek culture, they baptized it. And they turned into a new worship genre, and they used the hymns to celebrate, to praise, to magnify their God, Jesus Christ. 
Even the historians of those times mention it, that these are the folks that keep on singing hymns to a God of theirs, Jesus Christ. Of course, Jesus Christ was not only divine, he is also human. And you can see several hymns of these kinds in uh, the New Testament. For instance, Philippians chapter 2, or Hebrews chapter 1, or Colossians chapter 1, where a hymn, a praise song is dedicated to Jesus Christ being the God that became human. Now, in those days, they did not only sing hymns. From the New Testament, we find that they also had the psalms, they had the hymns, and they had spiritual songs as well. It seems that those spiritual songs were more spontaneous, like the song of Anna or the song of Simon or Simeon from the New Testament. That definition of him is somewhat different from what we use today. Because if I ask you what a hymn was, you would probably tell me, well, it's a song from the hymnal. But did you know not all the songs in the hymnals are hymns? There are different genres in the hymnal. There are chorales, there are psalms, there are gospel songs, there are Negro spirituals, there are marches. All those different genres are there in the hymnal. But it's, it's beautiful to, to have a hymn you, or to have a song that you can take and use in different contexts of your life. And it seems that John took the lyrics of a hymn and he said, okay, I'm going to shape the lyrics of this hymn and create a beautiful introduction, a beautiful prologue, a chiastic structure to get my gospel going. And this is what he says. He starts with the first words of his gospel, in the beginning was the word. Right? And when you look at the triangle, I would need to see the triangle on screen. Yes, you can see how he builds his beautiful structure using the lyrics of a hymn sung by the congregation of his times. And right there at the top is the message that we are going to look at this morning. John chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. But I would need the next slide so that you can see how he constructs this beautiful chiastic structure like a roof. Where the most important, the main message is up there at the peak. Right there at the climax. Right there at the summit of it. So you have right down at the foot of the hill... On the uphill slide, God the Creator, God the Father, and God Jesus Christ the Creator. Then you have a conflict. And uh, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot master the light. You have an intermezzo John the Baptist ministry, and then you go on with the conflict motive. And right at the peak, you have covenant. Please notice this classical structure. You have creation, conflict, and covenant. And then you come backwards down. But before going there, I would like to read this covenant section of the hymn. Because what John is doing practically is he leads his readers up to the top, so that when you are right there on top of the world, you can jump and celebrate and say, hey, this is wonderful. This is the essence of the gospel. So John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right... What right? 
He gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of whom? Of God. Beautiful message right there at the top of the chiasm. And now watch and see how the chiasm goes on with the downhill section. So upwards you had creator, conflict, conflict, covenant. Downwards you have covenant, fullness, fullness, and then the relationship between the Father and the Son. Because the Son is being presented to us as the exegete of the Father. Does anybody know what exegesis means? Exegesis is when somebody takes the Bible and brings out its message, unfolds its message. Jesus Christ, and that's exactly the word used in chapter 1 verse 18. He is the exegete of the Father. He brings the Father out. He makes the Father known. He introduces, he reveals the Father. But in between covenant and this section about the Father and Son relationship, you have the fullness of God revealed in Jesus Christ. And this fullness is comprised in two words. What are the two words? John speaks about the children of God. Those that got the right to be called children of God. And he says, I am part of them. Because in verse 14 he says, and the word became flesh. And he dwelt or he pitched his tent. He tabernacled among who? Us, me included. Then he goes on and he speaks about the fullness because he was full of grace and truth, he says in verse 14. But then he later comes back to it and he says, yes, we all received from his fullness. What is his fullness? Grace and truth. And then he emphasizes and he says, grace after grace. This is a, a beautiful and interesting structure because you can see how the main elements all bring together, together the, the main focus of the gospel. Why is the gospel the good news? Because at one point, people that were lost, people that were deep in their sins, they get a chance to come out. They get a chance to be called children of God. If they receive Jesus Christ, the Son, who is the revelation, the spit and image of the Father. Now, in order for somebody to be able to receive, somebody else has to, what? Give. Very easy. And the scenario is simple. Some children were kidnapped, abducted by the enemy. And now the father wants his children back. The kidnapper says, no, 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 you can't get them back. First of all, they don't want to go back to you. They have a problem with your character. I don't know what you did with them, but had you been a good father, they would have not come with me. Huh? And second, if anybody from among them would ever decide they wanted to go back to the father... Well, it would not be ethical for me to just give them over to you like that. You should pay a ransom for them. So this is exactly what God does. He gives. He gives his son as a demonstration of his love, of his character toward them. Love that is comprised of grace and truth. And at the same time, he pays the ransom. Because Jesus Christ does not only reveal the Father, he actually dies for you. And the biblical word in the New Testament, hyper, actually means instead of you or on your behalf. 
In order for me and you to benefit of this, we have to receive. The question is, all right, but how am I going to receive what the Father gives? And it's simple. The explanation is right there in the verse, verse uh, 12. This is what uh, verse 12 says. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, exousia in Greek, I'll come back to it, to become children of God to those who do what? Who believe in his name. Now, this is a very intricate concept. Faith or belief. Or to believe. You know, it's complicated, it's confusing even. Because today everybody has uh, some sort of faith. I don't know if you've noticed that. Not necessarily religious faith, but somebody, uh, if, if you just ask somebody randomly, he would believe something or she would believe something. We all believe something. Well, this is what I believe. No? The other day I watched an interview with an inmate. And he was asked, uh, sir, why are you here? And he answered, because of my faith. Huh, because of your faith. What do you mean? Well, you know, I did some uh, shoplifting. And I believed they will not catch me. <laughs> that was his belief. Poor guy. Ah, everybody has a faith. Everybody has some sort of belief. The, the question is, what is the biblical definition of faith or to believe? In the Greek, you have the noun pistis and the verb pisteo from the same root. It would be translated into English with faith and the corresponding verb of faith. What would be the corresponding verb of faith? To? Well, that's the problem because that's misleading. The corresponding word, verb for faith would be to faith. Why? Because in the English language you have belief, right? Noun. And you have the corresponding verb, what? To believe. Are you following me? Okay? Uh, that's the English language. I'm trying to sort out meanings here. So if belief corresponds to to believe, then faith would correspond to what? To? To faith. But you don't have that verb in the English language. Maybe to have faith. The only way for faith, noun, you would have to believe as a verb if faith and belief is the same thing. They are synonymous. But let me ask you, is faith and belief synonymous? Are they synonymous? Well, not really. They have some overlapping meanings, but it's not exactly the same. Because faith is a much larger concept than belief. Belief is part of faith, but is not everything from faith. Faith in biblical definition means belief, trust, and faithfulness. Put them all together and you have the content of the word faith. And you would need a verb to express that same reality, to, to faith. To believe is not enough. You need something more complex there. Interestingly, John never uses in his gospel the noun faith. He always uses the, the, wor the, the verb to faith. So what he says, when somebody receives Jesus Christ as the exegete of the Father, as the one that delivers the fullness of the Father, he or she has to have faith in him. How? Well, first of all, you believe what Jesus Christ says. You believe what Jesus Christ says because belief comes through hearing. Faith comes through hearing, says the Apostle Paul, right? And the hearing comes where? From? From the Word of God. So that's how faith starts. Believing. With a belief. It starts with accepting the Word of Jesus Christ, receiving them, and by that, 
receiving the Father's words themselves because he came from the Father. Then trust. Trust means to trust Jesus Christ and through him to trust the Father himself because now you are becoming his child. And faithfulness. It's interesting how the English renders it. It's actually faith's fullness, right? Faithfulness, which also means reciprocity. It means a mutual relationship. And when, when you speak about faithfulness, yes, you are faithful to Jesus Christ, the one the Father said. And through him, you are faithful to the Father himself. Now, when you receive Jesus Christ, the exegete of the Father, the, the Son from the bosom of the Father, that's what the Bible says, then you receive a right. You have a right. Wow, a right? Actually, the word in the Greek language is exousia, which is more than just right. It's authority. And exousia, authority, has two elements. It's rights and responsibilities. And yes, when somebody becomes a child of God, he has rights and he has what? Responsibilities. Yes, you, it's a huge right. It's a, it's a human divine right, if you want, to, to be able to call God your father. Because if you call God your father, it means that somehow you resemble your father. If you received Jesus Christ, you received the father, therefore you are a child of the father. Not everybody has the right to call God his or her father in this sense, yes. Biologically, by creation, we are all his children. Some are rebellious, some are faithful. But this is about calling God your father as a child that believes, as a child that trusts, as a child that is faithful to the father. Isn't that somewhat different from just, hey, he's the father of everybody? It's beautiful to see how John uses the word father. It seems that he is fond of the concept of father. In his first epistle, the letter, 1 John, he says God is love. That's the definition he gives about God. You know that definition, right? God is love. He never uses that same definition in John the Gospel. What he says, God is the Father. But it seems that for him, God is love and God is the Father is the same reality. Because God is love means God is grace and truth. And yes, a father, a real father combines these two elements of education, of parenting, grace, and truth. Beautiful. I don't know too much about his experience. I know he was the son of Zebedee. Does anybody know what the name of his father was? John's father's name? Nobody knows John's father's name? I said he was the son of Zebedee, okay? Zebedee is not his mother, okay? Zebedee is his father. Oh, all right. So he had a father, and we know from the Gospels that he would go with his father on the lake to do what? Oh, what a cool dad, huh? What? Go with your sons, James and John, Fishing. If they had had a surfboard next to the ocean, if they had time, you know, because they had to work. Fishing was not leisure. It was hard work. But they, they worked together. What we know from, from uh, the Gospels is that John and James, they had a surname. They were the sons of Thunder. So Thunder was their father. Huh? Well, maybe Zebedee was a thunder. I don't know. Most people say that the name indicates that they had a thundersome character. They were like, ah, you know, you, could, you couldn't deal with them easily. But then somebody came to them and 
told them, hey guys, come with me, come follow me. And they stepped out of the boat, they left uh, poor Zebedee. Come on guys, let's get this fish home. Daddy, bye-bye. And they had to go. They went, followed the master because the master was exegeting, was bringing out, was folding out the father's character. And they wanted to know the father. And for more than 120 times in his gospel, John speaks about the Father. For him, everything is about the Father. Because the Father, God, is love. And the Father sent his Son, Jesus Christ, in his fullness. He's the spirit and image of the Father. His fullness is grace and truth. Isn't the gospel beautiful? Now, not everybody here among us had the chance to have a father or a mother a parent in this life full of grace and truth. Some of our parents only had truth and they were the authoritarian abusers. Some of our parents only had grace and they were the permissive abusers. That's the reality. But Jesus Christ, the exegete of the Father, comes to us to bring out the character of the Father. And he tells you, 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 you. I don't know what your father was. I don't, he knows. And he tells you, you have a father, a real one. And in his character, these two elements, grace and truth, are in the perfect combination for you to grow in his fullness. Yes, rights. If you have a father, you have inheritance in my father's house, said Jesus. So you have a, a right to that place, right? But, but I, I'm, I'm pained when I see that many Christians are stuck there. All they want to do is they want to get to heaven. All I, Pastor, I don't care. All I want is to go to heaven. I don't care about anything. No, no, no. If you have a father, if you're a child of God, you have more rights than that. It's a huge right to have siblings. Say amen. Huh. Siblings. Only those that did not have siblings. They know what it means not to have siblings. You have a, a big brother called Jesus Christ. Yes, you are the child of the father through him. And he went to prepare the place in his father's house. Your father's house. But that's not all. You have other siblings. We call one another brother, sister, brother Nick, sister Mary. Beautiful, isn't it? Let me tell you something. Brother and sister is not limited to Seventh-day Adventists. <clears throat> no, it's not. We have brothers and sisters in other denominations as well. Not everybody can be called brother and sister in other denominations, but we have, even among the pagans. You don't believe me? Let's read it together. Desire of Ages. 638. I read this first part of the passage last time. I'm going one step further to make a point. Among the hidden are those who worship God. How? Ignorantly. They, they don't know too much. Those to whom the light is never brought by human instrumentality, yet they will not perish. Go on. Though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature. Yes, because the creator speaks in nature as well. And have done the things that the law required. Their works are evidence that the Holy Spirit, watch this, the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts. And they are recognized as, say it aloud, children of God among the pagans. Wow. And the Apostle Paul confirms that indeed it is the Holy Spirit that brings us into this adoption. Romans chapter 8 verses 14 and 15. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. These are what? 
sons of God. Verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, I would say re-adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, actually what it says, Daddy, Father, Daddy, you cry out and say, Daddy. But then you also have responsibility. Because exousia is not only rights, it's also responsibilities. You know, right after their baptism, Jesus told his disciples, right after their baptisms, as the Father sent me, so send I you. You should have already stopped me. Because he did not say that right after their baptism. He said that three years and a half later. And that makes a difference. Because three years and a half he poured into those people. And then he sent them. That's called discipleship. And that's responsibility. See? Somebody that was born and raised in a larger family could not avoid parenting. Not parenting as a receiver of parenting, but parenting as something you do, even if you are not the or the parent. I, had four, I have four brothers, a family of six, mother, father, and four brothers. The eldest parented me. He was two years older than me. Uh, misparenting, that's what you call it. <laughs> but he, he parented me. But then I got the chance to parent my younger brothers, five and seven years younger than me. It was not a right only, it was a responsibility. It was expected of you, if you were a child of your parents, to parent your siblings. Yes, I got a chance to feed them, to bathe them, to rock them, to change their diapers, even wash their diapers. Yeah, that, that was the time. The, the, I'm, I'm using these illustrations because that's the, the time of the Bible. And those are the illustrations the Bible uses. We have responsibilities, not only rights. I have to help them grow from babyhood to a kid, uh, a kid, from a kid to a youngster, from a youngster to a full-fledged adult. Is it different in the spiritual realm? When somebody is born again, do they become... Uh, Babies, kids, youngsters, or adults? What do they become? Ah, so then why do we treat them as adults? A baptism is a great celebration. So good, the baby is here. And then everybody leaves. Who's going to feed the baby? Who's going to rock the baby? Who's going to bathe the baby? Who's going to change some diapers because babies mess up? I'm, I'm speaking not about biological people here. I'm speaking about spiritual growth. We have responsibility. So how is, how is a spiritual baby going to become a spiritual kid, then a spiritual youngster, than a spiritual adult, parent. How? The father is not here. Nobody has seen the father. His son, the only begotten son, our elderly brother, uh, our eldest brother, he, he went back, right? He's not here physically. We have the Holy Spirit. But how is the Holy Spirit with us? Is he a hologram? Like the hologram of uh, the Abba group? 
something that is, is there but is not there. By the way, Abba does, doesn't have to do uh, with this Abba from the Bible, okay? That's, uh, that's uh, a different kind of Abba. It's not the same meaning. But the Holy Spirit wants to use you and me. That's how parenting, that's how discipleship happens. We call it sp spiritual growth or to grow in faith. To grow in faith? Yes. To grow in, to grow in belief. Let me ask you, is the belief of a kid the same as the belief of a baby? Why not? Because of growth. Is the belief of a youngster the same as the belief of a kid? No? Why not? Because of growth. Is the belief of a, an adult, a parent, the same as the belief of a youngster? Is it the same? Why not? Because of growth. Take trust. Trust. Can a baby trust? Does a baby trust? Let me tell you something. I've seen it happen. If a baby is hungry, that baby will take almost any breast. When my youngest brother was born, an aunt had a baby too. So my mom and the aunt. One day mom had to drop off something at the house of my aunt. And the baby was crying like crazy. He was, he was all over the place. His grandma was there with him, my cousin. And uh, told mom, hey, I don't know what to do with him. He, he, he drives me crazy. And mom thought about it. Took the baby, gave him a breast, and he took it. A spiritual baby is vulnerable. Yeah, he would trust if, if you are around, but a baby has needs. A spiritual kid can be easily abducted. Yes, that's a reality. Watch out. A spiritual kid can be abducted. A spiritual youngster can cave under peer pressure. It's nothing to play with. Yes, when you cave under peer pressure, it takes maturity. You have to become a parent to finally understand, a spiritual parent to finally understand the responsibility. Hey, I cannot play with this because I have children watching me. And I have responsibility. And then take faithfulness. Faith's fullness. I said it's reciprocity. Mutual relationship. Faithfulness is to reflect God's fullness. And how is God's fullness reflected? Grace and truth. Wow. Wow. You know, when I first heard about this church, this beautiful church, the first thing I did, you know what it was? What everybody would do. Go online and check it out. That, that's the reality we live in. Okay? And something caught my attention. It was the beautiful mission statement. To know him or to know Jesus and make him known. I said, wow, this is beautiful. That's all discipleship. Because spiritual infants and spiritual kids, for them the most important thing is to know Jesus. From spiritual youngsters on to spiritual adults, they not only know Jesus, they also want to make him known. But here's the danger. If I get to know a distorted picture of God, that's the exact picture I'm going to make known. 
if I know God only as grace, I'm a dangerous person. If I know God only as truth, I am a dangerous person because I misrepresent the character of God and I mislead the children and the potential children of God. Yes, it is responsibility. The Seventh-day Adventist Church historically has been struggling with this. Because we came to the platform on the scene of history as a movement that reestablishes what? What? The truth. And that didn't come without danger. Ellen White saw the danger already in her time. And in her time already, she pulled the alarm time and time again. Look at what she says in Review and Herald. Review and Herald in uh, 1890. Review and Herald, 1890. As a people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. Huh, that's a real challenge. Have you seen some of the hills in the area here? Well, if you go toward the desert, same picture. That's why I, I, I picked this one. But she has plenty of warnings like this. And this became a big reality in some of the churches. It became a systemic and systematic problem. I happen to have grown up in a church where there was much truth and little to no grace. And then I studied theology. I started in 2000. And I learned even more truth. And a little grace. The breakthrough came to me early in my ministry when I started listening and watching to sermons of Alejandro Bullon. I don't know if you know Alejandro Bullon. Uh, take him as a Mark Finley of the Hispanic segment or uh, C.D. Brooks of uh, the African-American segment. So he's, he's a big evangelist. And and listening to how he exposed the God, how he exegeted the Father, I started understanding what Ellen White was saying when she would use the, sin, the, the, the expression, the truth as it is in Jesus. That's not any kind of truth. The truth that is in Jesus is grace and truth. It's mixed with grace. Otherwise, you cannot take it. And there was a sentence that moved me to tears time and time again. He would say in almost every evangelistic sermon, he would say, you are the most beautiful thing that God has on this earth. And he had a way of saying it, that you would look at yourself and would ask, me? Me, the most beautiful thing? And in, in, in such a context, I, I got to, to have my own conversations. And I sort of sat down and I said, I have to sort this out because I'm missing out big time. I'm missing out on something. I don't know what it is, but I'm missing out on something. So I took my two boxes, okay? I'm going to oversimplify the process a little bit for the sake of, of understanding. It's an illustration, but it's real, lived by me, okay? So I opened the, 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 the box of truth, and man, it was pretty full, packed. I opened the box of grace, and I realized, wow, not too much there. 
So then I, I, I wanted to understand what is going on, what is wrong. And I said, okay, I want to sort out the truth. I want to make sure truth is really truth. So I poured everything out. And I said, oh my goodness, all kind of truths. Huh, wow. So I, I, found, I found truths that were my personal ideas. My personal ideas. Yeah, my favorite color is blue. Yeah. Okay, these are my ideas. Those are my truths. Then I looked and I saw there was another category, the truth of my family. Yeah, my family traditions, inheritance. We all have those, don't we? Then I looked and I saw, oh, right, this is society. This is pop culture. Whatever, whatever people speak about out there. All right, huh, a lot of truth. And then I looked and I said, okay, so this is now, this is now divine truth. Okay, this goes back into the box. But when I, when I watched closer, I had a revelation. Hey, some of these are red and some of these are actually orange. They look very much alike, but they are not the same. One category is divine truth. Divine truth that is revealed here. Okay? The other one is called church tradition. And that's the most dangerous thing. Because for most people, these two categories are the same category. You really need to have a point of reference to know how to sort these out. Okay, this is, this is, uh, I don't even see. You need light, you know. You need light to see the difference. All right, this is red. This is orange, red. Hmm, okay. Red, you always need the light. You cannot sort them out otherwise. You need the light, you sort them out. And man, this is what I was left with. But this is a great start. Because you have room enough to go on reading the Bible and put the truth one truth after the other in the box of truth. Those other things, they are not evil necessarily. They become evil, and especially this that very much resembles what God says, but it's not what God says. That's the most dangerous because people have elevated those at the level of divine truth, and it's not. And when I did this Exercise. It's a process. It's not something you do one day. I looked into the other box. And you know what I realized? It was feeling up. Because we lose grace when we think that what Jesus said, that the Holy Spirit will come and lead us in all truth, it's about all truth. My truth, your truth. Uh, pop culture truth, church tradition truth, every truth. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit comes and leads in divine truth. And when you hold on to divine truth, that's when you can also fill up with divine grace. And I realized how important grace really was. How indispensable it was. Because without grace, no sinner will ever get born again. Without grace, the diapers of a baby, of a spiritual baby, will never be changed. Without grace, the child, that, the kid that was abducted, when he comes back, he will be beaten up. Without grace, the youngster that messes up, that caves under peer pressure, that is misled by others, he will never get a second chance. Without grace, spiritual parents or heartless 
tyrants, dangerous monsters. And there are churches where entire generations were lost, driven out by the truths. Not divine truth. Truths. And it, from most churches, my generation, the millennials, are missing altogether. Where are the millennials in this church? And this is what happened. Because you, you have to keep it in balance. You have the pendulum up here at the extreme of truth. We reaffirm, we reestablish, we restate the truth. You have it here, it goes wrong, and then it swings out all the way here. And now you have people that don't want to hear about truth. I'm fed up with truth. I'm sick and tired of truth. Don't even mention the truth to me. And we are struggling, brothers and sisters. I could lie, but that's the truth. We are struggling, and we are here at the end of history, and we are struggling big time with the character of God that we should reflect, grace and truth. But there is hope. There always is hope. Until grace is available, there is hope. There is no hope when you take grace away before grace is taken away. What's that? Some people have taken grace away before grace being taken away. So the hope is, and I want to really applaud, you know, what God has done to some of you. I came here two weeks ago to a memorial service. Some of you were here. Memorial service to Greg Wees. Name is? Yes. Fred. Good, good, good. Those, those that knew the guy know the name. See? You should have shouted. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Because only a group of people even knew him. But thank God there was a group of people that knew him. Because this guy came to the Lord and became a spiritual baby when he was already uh, an old guy. You can imagine that. And I, I listened to the tribute of some of, of his spiritual parents here. I was, I was amazed. It was a delight. To see how, how gently they were describing an old guy that was a spiritual kid when he moved, maybe a youngster, when he moved to Las Vegas. And one of his pain, one of his complaints was, ah, I can't find a church like Laguna Niguel. And I said, yes, 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 that's good, that's good. Do you know what that means? Let me translate it. I cannot find a church like Laguna Niguel because there I had spiritual parents. They were growing me. They were growing me up. That's what I want to see here. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. His fullness. Grace and truth combined. So the baby becomes a kid, the kid becomes a younger, youngster, the youngster becomes a parent, and the cycle repeats itself. I want to encourage you to embark with me on that journey in His name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen.